He is risen. He is risen indeed. Welcome to our Easter service. It's good to see you all. And it's good to be seen. Hope you all enjoy our service this morning. And I hope all of you have a blessed Easter. And uh, while I know they weren't built for our enjoyment, I want to thank Pastor Marcos for the wonderful decorations. Um, they always do a fabulous job on special holidays, and it looks wonderful, and I think it uh, is highly appropriate for the occasion. Um, do have a couple of announcements this morning. On Sunday the 7th, we will have an administrative council meeting. Our, the realtor who is handling our business with the parsonage will be here to let us know where things stand and what needs to be done. There are a couple of other issues on the agenda, but hopefully it won't take too long. Um, I want to remind everybody about our must ministry uh, program. The jar is back there if you care to make donations. Again, if you would prefer to include it in an offering check, you can just put in the designation line what you want to have go to must, and uh, they highly appreciate our contributions. I uh, want to remind everybody that we are asking our members to pray for the church every day, either at 8 a.m. or at 8 p.m., or for those of you who like to pray, 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Um, never underestimate the power of prayer for the support of our church and our mission and uh, guidance for the direction that we need to move in. Um, let's see, Sue Smith has a birthday. Happy birthday. Sean Savage has a birthday. Happy birthday. Uh, let's see. Sue Smith also is celebrating joining the church 48 years ago. And uh, Victor Blackstone's been a member for seven years. And Becky has been a member for 58 years. Maybe we could have a round of happy birthday. <laughs>
this background was built for our enjoyment too. I feel like I'm at the garden tent today. It really, really makes you just be in awe when you walk in. Our first hymn of the day is four, page 444, Low in the Grave He Lay. <laughs> that he didn't stay dead, that he rose from the grave 
that his resurrection conquered death, not just for him, but for all of us who believe. And that it opened the door for a salvation that had never before been available to mankind. So as we go into our time of prayer, pray on those things. Now, this afternoon, whenever your prayer time is. This morning we have prayer requests from Charles Johnson, from Ann, Heidi Moeller, Samantha Spradling, Patrice Monken, Becky Newton, Cindy Franklin. We're asked to continue praying for Alton Waits, Anne Marie and Dave, Amanda Schmidt, Bobby, Carol Fuller, Camilla Munoz, Caroline, Elizabeth Fagan, Faye New, Gene Smith, Graham Sykes, Hunter and Ann McAfee, Jack Lamberson, Gene Kibler, Joan Hill, Logan Smith, Margaret Hughes, Margaret, Marguerite Taylor, Margaret Danny Simpson, Marlo Keith, Martha Childers, Phyllis McLean, Ray Tucker, Ron Johnson, Sandy, Sarah Polk, Victor Blackstone, Wendy Tedder, Willie Neal Kane. We also want to pray for all of those living at Gaines Park, where we carry a ministry once a month. And we want to pray for those fine people that, that they're free from loneliness and, and have peace in Christ. We also want to pray for the political unrest in Brazil. We want to keep in mind all of those who've been subject to natural disasters or man-made disasters and the violence of crime and war that spreads around our world. We hope to find a quick solution for those in the Northeast who were affected by the bridge collapse those who've been put out of their homes or separated from their families or lost loved ones due to violence and war. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, before we ask of you, we must thank you. We are truly grateful for the gift of your son, for the sacrifice that he made on our behalf. For his suffering, for his deliverance, and for his resurrection. We thank you for the glory of your plan of salvation, without which none of us would have hope or peace. And I ask that you bless these fine people this Easter Sunday and in all the days to come. We do ask that you extend your healing hand to those we have named, those who are suffering from illness <coughs> or other struggles. We know that so many things are beyond our power to fix, but nothing is beyond your power. We ask that you bring peace, comfort, and strength to all of those who suffer, all of those who have need. And that on this Easter Sunday, we may be blessed and given the strength to carry the gospel and the truth to those who haven't heard it or who haven't accepted it yet. I ask you to bless this church and lend us guidance that we may do only what is pleasing in your sight and pursue your will for us as a church. And we pray all of these things in the name of your risen Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Now, if y'all would join me in the reading of our affirmation of faith, you'll find it in the bulletin. It can also be found as number 738 in our hymnal. Let us unite in this historic confession of the Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
So you may have noticed in the bulletin I have two scripture readings this morning. But at least in my mind and heart they fit together. So I'm going to start with 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4. And this is from the New English Translation. Now I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel that I preach to you, that you received and on which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I passed on to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as though to one born at the wrong time, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me has not been in vain. In fact, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether it was I or they, this is the way we preach, and this is the way you believe. My second scripture comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, and it's verses 1 through 18. It tells the story you've heard many times. Now, very early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been moved away from the entrance. So she went running to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved and told them, They have taken the Lord from the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out to go to the tomb. The two were running together. But the other disciple ran faster than Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down and saw the strips of linen cloth lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who had been following him, arrived and went right into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen cloth lying there and the face cloth, which had been around Jesus' head not lying with the strips of linen cloth, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first came in, and he saw and believed. For they did not yet understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. So the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. As she wept, she bent down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been lying, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Mary replied, They have taken my Lord away, and I do not know where they have put him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? Because she thought he was the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will take him. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus replied, Do not touch me, 
for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Go to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and informed the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and she told them what Jesus had said to her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Again, he is risen. So everybody who's ever attended an Easter service knows the story of the crucifixion and Jesus' resurrection. As I mentioned before, on Good Friday, we talked about what happened during the time between the death of Jesus and the resurrection. We do know that Jesus truly died, both physically and spiritually. We do know that he experienced a separation from the Father. We do not know exactly how long that lasted. It may have been a moment. It may have been hours. But we do know that it did not last all the way until the morning of the resurrection because Jesus was busy during that time. It's easy to treat this like the end of the story. Then there are those, like most of you, who have been in church and studies long enough to know that Jesus did not ascend to heaven for good until at least 40 days had passed. During these 40 days, Jesus appeared to hundreds of his followers. We know that during the time just prior to his resurrection, Jesus preached to the lost spirits of the dead. On the day of resurrection, many saints rose from the dead and walked the streets of Jerusalem. So what is my point here? When Jesus said from the cross, it is finished, he meant his purpose as a human was completed. But this does not mean that the work of Jesus Christ is over. Far from it. See, the work of Christ began before time began. The Gospel of John tells us right at the very beginning that Jesus is the vessel, the vehicle through which all of the universe was created. It says in the beginning was the Word. And Jesus is the Word. So Jesus' work began long before he came to earth as a human. It continued during those 33 years while he was here as a human. It continued in those 40 days after the resurrection when he appeared to so many. And it continued after the ascension when he went to heaven. Even after the ascension, he wasn't quite done with us. It wasn't until several years after the resurrection that Jesus appeared to Paul and converted him from his evil path to make him the great apostle. It is vital to remember that, that Christ is a part of a bigger whole, the Holy Trinity. And when we talk about Jesus, probably most of the time we're talking about the human Jesus who was on earth for 33 years conducting his ministry. But Jesus Christ has always been as a part of the whole as one of the personalities of the Holy Trinity, as an essential part of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.
So Jesus' work began before time, and Jesus' work continues to this day and, and beyond. We don't know how long, if there is such a thing as time at that point. But imagine for a minute the day of ascension. When, when Jesus stopped being human, part of this world, and ascended to his Father. Imagine the reception that he received in heaven. Rejoined with the Father and the Holy Spirit. No coronation of kings. No inauguration of presidents, not even Mardi Gras in New Orleans, can compare to the singing and rejoicing and worship of the angels and the heavenly spirits at the ascension of Jesus Christ, at the completion of that new covenant that paved the way not just for forgiveness of sins, but for true salvation for men who would believe. So when Jesus said it is finished, it was just to mark the accomplishment of his purpose as a human. His work is never finished. There is no beginning, there is no end. When we say the prayer of salvation, or when we said the prayer of salvation, we state our belief that Jesus died for our sins and rose again to conquer death. But even the Apostles' Creed ends with Jesus as the judge of the world at the end of time as we know it. And this day of judgment even is not the end of the work of Jesus Christ. Because he has been designated judge of the world. But he's not done. Because Jesus is coming back. When he comes back, in his power, he will put an end to the reign of Satan. You know, that guy Satan that's really unpopular to talk about these days? Jesus is going to put an end to all that. He still has much to do. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, it says, Don't remember these early events. Don't recall these former events. Look, I am about to do something new. Now it begins to happen. Do you not recognize it? Yes, I will make a road in the wilderness and paths in the wastelands. This scripture serves two purposes. It prophesies the return of the Jews to their home country. But it is also a symbolic prophecy of the something new that Jesus will create. Second Corinthians chapter 5 says, so then, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. What is old has passed away. Look, what, has, what is new has come. So that scripture is talking about all believers being made new. But that's new in this life. But then there's Revelation. Revelation chapter 21 says this, 
Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and earth had ceased to exist, and the sea existed no more. I, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, made ready like a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, the residence of God is among human beings. He will live among them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death will not exist anymore or mourning or crying or pain for the former things have ceased to exist. And the one seated on the throne said, look, I am making all things new. Then he said to me, write it down because these words are reliable and true. He also said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the one who is thirsty, I will give water free of charge from the spring of the water of life. The one who conquers will inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son. But as for the cowards, unbelievers, detestable persons, murderers, the sexually immoral, and those who practice magic spells, idol worshipers, and all those who lie, their place will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur. That is the second death. So this is the work of Jesus yet to be done. Easter is far from a celebration of the resurrection of Christ. It's a jubilee honoring the glory and majesty of God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This 33-year life of Christ as a human is but a brief moment in the work of the Lord. But it is this brief moment that restores man to what he was created to be. It is our recreation so that God the Father may dwell with us at long last. That's my favorite part of the Revelation scripture that I read. Look, the residence of God is among human beings. He will live among them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them. See, that was the intent from the very beginning when God made Adam and Eve in the garden. He dwelt with them. He came and walked with them in the evening. That's what God has always wanted, is to dwell with his creation. And we rendered ourselves unworthy of that. And throughout scripture, we have covenant after covenant after covenant where God gave man a way to repent. But at no time during all those years was there a way for man to render himself clean and holy enough for God to dwell with us. Until... Jesus rose out of that grave. And until Jesus ascended to the Father. That plan has been put in place. For the first time, we have the means to be rendered, not to render ourselves, but to be rendered holy and worthy to dwell with God. Not by anything that we can do, but what Jesus Christ has already done. <coughs> Jesus has 
33 years here was just a flash in time. I want to close with this. And I'm way early. On Good Friday, I read a scripture from Ephesians. It was a description of our death in sin. And it went like this, and although you were dead in your offenses and sins, in which you formerly lived according to this world's present path, according to the ruler of the domain of the air, the ruler of the spirit that is now energizing the sons of disobedience, among whom all of us also formerly lived out our lives in the cravings of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But as Paul Harvey used to say, here's the rest of the story. <clears throat> because it goes on, and it says, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even though we were dead in offenses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you are saved. Amen? Amen. This is from Romans. If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also give us all things with him? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace today and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Amen.